This video is going to continue our work with applications of differential equations, this time extending into second ordered differential equations using mechanical vibrations, specifically modeling free undamped motions. The question we're going to be working on is how do we model these vibrations? And specifically, what we're looking at is undamped motion. Undamped motion basically means we're looking at having no shocks on the car. Visually, what we're looking at is we've got a wall that's going to have some type of spring attached to it and that spring is attached to some mass. And it can be stretched to and from a point that is going to be considered the equilibrium point. Basically at the equilibrium point the spring would be in rest and so we can stretch it some distance x. In fact if x is positive we're going to say that means the spring has been stretched. And if x is negative, we're going to say that spring has been compressed. And basically, there's going to be no friction here. We're just going to pull back the spring and let it go, and it's going to bounce back and forth infinite number of times until we finally act on it by an outside force. So to help us model this situation, we've got a couple things that need to come together. First, we have something we're going to steal from physics called Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law says that the force of the spring is equal to the opposite of the spring constant times x. And again, k is the spring constant. And every spring has its own spring constant that's unique to that spring. We can also have some external force that acts on it. And we're going to call the external force F sub E. And that can be any function depending on what external force is acting on it. Which means if we put that together, the total force that's acting on this spring, we can call that F, is equal to the spring's force plus the external force. But we also know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. We saw that in a prior video. And if that's the case, we also know that acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity and also the second derivative of the position. So if we put this all together, we're going to get a differential equation that is second ordered linear with constant coefficients. Our total force now is F, which is mass times the second derivative is equal to the spring force which is negative kx plus the external force which is f of t and to put it in the form that we're more familiar with seeing we're going to add that kx to both sides and we get this differential equation this is going to be the differential equation that we're working with today. Actually, we're going to tweak it a little bit. We're going to deal with what is called free undamped motion. And when we say we have free undamped motion, what we're saying is those external forces, or f of x, is equal to zero. In other words, no outside forces are going to act on this spring at all. It's going to be completely free from those external forces. And when we do that, our differential equation becomes the mass times the second derivative plus the spring constant 
times its position equals zero. Let's take a look at how we can solve this differential equation. First, to get it in the correct form, we have to divide everything by m. So we have x double prime plus k over m x equals 0. Then, replacing x double prime with our d squared plus k over m equals 0. We can see that because k and m both have to be positive, the mass is positive, the spring constant is positive, we'll see that when we solve it, we end up with complex solutions. d is equal to plus or minus i times the square root of k over m. So we put that complex solution into our formula. So we say x is equal to a constant. I'm going to call the constant a. Cosine of the complex part, which is the square root of k over m times t plus the second constant I'm going to call b sine of the square root of k over m times t. And what we're going to find is this format is not going to be very informative as far as what the graph looks like. It's going to be much more useful to us to figure out what this would be written as a single sign. And this goes back to your Math 142 days in trigonometry and how we can combine a cosine plus sine into a single sign. And the way we did that is we have a new coefficient, we'll call it c, and it turns out that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. And once we find c, then we say that the cosine of alpha is equal to b over c, and the sine of alpha is equal to a over c. And notice the a and the b come from the opposite trig function that we're solving. The, when we're doing cosine, we use the b, which came from the sine. When we have the sine of alpha, we'll use the a, which came from the cosine. Those are backwards. Using these, we can figure out what quadrant alpha is in and then correctly identify what alpha is so that we can rewrite our equation as x equals c times the sine of the square root of k over m times t plus some shift of alpha. And this sine wave represents what's often called harmonic motion. A couple important notes though about this process before we dive into an example. It's very important that the mass must be in kilograms and the stretch constants must be in meters. If the units are off, it does not work and it'll give you some weird um, useless answer. So make sure you've got the correct units as you're working. All right, so this is the process described in number one. Instead of memorizing an equation, we're going to find it's easier just to work through the actual steps to calculate this. So let's do that. Let's do an example. Let's say a 500 gram mass is attached to a spring that can be stretched two meters with a force of 100 newtons. And it's going to begin, and when I say begin, I mean time is equal to zero, one meter to the right of equilibrium. 
can be released with a velocity of 5 meters per second to the left. We're going to make an equation to represent the harmonic motion this mass will go through, and then we'll also take a look at what the graph is going to look like for this harmonic motion. First thing we need to know about any spring, though, is its spring constant. And so we know that force is equal to a constant times the distance it is stretched. And in this case, stretch is 2 meters with a force of 100 newtons. So 100 is equal to k times 2. In other words, k is equal to 50. Next, we know that the differential equation we need is the mass times the second derivative plus the constant times x equals 0. So in our case, the mass is 500 grams, but be careful, that has to be in kilograms. That's 0.5 kilograms. The units need to be right. 0.5 kilograms times x prime prime plus our constant which we said was 50x equals 0. And this becomes the differential equation we want to solve in order to find our harmonic motion. Multiplying by 2 gives us x prime prime plus 100x equals 0. Changing to our characteristic equation, d squared plus 100 equals 0, so d is equal to plus or minus 10i. And so that's going to give us x is equal to a cosine of 10t plus b sine of 10t. Now, we don't know what a and b are yet, and that's where our initial values come in handy. We're given an initial value that it begins when time is 0, 1 meter to the right of equilibrium. So when time is 0, x is 1, and cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, so that tells me that a is equal to 1. The other initial value we have is about the initial velocity, that's x prime. So if we take the derivative, we get negative 10a sine of 10t plus 10b cosine of 10t. And so plugging in the value that the initial velocity is 5 meters per second, but be careful it's to the left. That means it's going to be negative. It's going backwards with that force. So we have negative 5 equals the sine of 0 is 0, the cosine of 0 is 1, so we have 10b, which means b is equal to negative 1 half. So put that together and we get x is equal to a, which is 1, cosine of 10t, plus b, which is negative 1 half, sine of 10t. And we've got our equation for the motion of the spring mass system over time. Now, this is hard to see the actual harmonic motion, so we are going to go through the steps to find it written as a single sign. The way we're going to do that is we're going to find our new constant, c squared, is a squared, 1 squared, plus b squared, which is negative 1 half squared, or 1 plus 4th, which is equal to 5 fourths. So that means c is equal to the square root of 5 over 2. Then we can take the cosine of alpha is going to be the b, which is negative 1 half, divided by the square root of 5 over 2, which reduces to negative 1 over the square root of 5. 
And the sine of alpha is equal to 1 divided by c, or the reciprocal of c. So that's, oops, wrote that backwards. Should be the square root of 5 over 2, and the reciprocal then is 2 over the square root of 5. Thinking about the location of this alpha angle then, cosine is negative, sine is positive, which it's going to stick it up here in the second quadrant. So when I find alpha by using either cosine inverse of negative 1 fifth or sine inverse of 2 over the square root of 5, I need to make sure it sticks me in the second quadrant. And cosine inverse will do that with a negative. So I'm going to do cosine inverse of negative 1 divided by the square root of 5 on my calculator, making sure I'm in radians. And that's going to give me alpha is equal to 2.03 approximately. So putting that together as a single sign then, x is equal to c, the square root of 5 over 2, times the sine of the 10t with a shift of 2.03. And this equation then models my harmonic motion. A couple things we can pull off this equation to get an idea of how it's behaving. We can see really quick that the amplitude is the coefficient, the square root of 5 over 2. We know the period is calculated as 2 pi divided by b, or 2 pi over 10. In this case, the period is going to be pi over 5. Often we're interested in the frequency of the wave. The frequency in hertz is just the reciprocal of the period which is going to be 5 over pi hertz. Or if you want it in radians per, uh, per second, you could just pull the 10 off and say it's 10 hertz. The B value is your hertz, but or is your radians per second. But I think the hertz is probably more useful because that's really what we use when we're talking about our harmonic motion. I'm going to go into Desmos here and put that equation in so we can get a visual of what the harmonic motion looks like. We've got the square root of 5 divided by 2 for our period. Then it's the sine of 10t. I have to use x in Desmos plus 2.03. And then this then is going to be the harmonic motion of our spring. And you can see it just is going to go on forever and ever, bouncing back and forth between that equilibrium point, which is probably not very realistic. Eventually, that spring is going to come to a stop, which leads us nicely into tomorrow's lesson. So hang tight for the damped motion. But for now, I want you to get a chance to practice some of this undamped motion with no friction, where it can oscillate forever. So take a look at practicing that free undamped motion, and we will see you in class to discuss this further.